What if that quality that you thought makes you least spiritual, that quality that you thought most disqualifies you from being around God, will actually become the meeting place? We are invited to make space in our lives in this season for Him because He's already there. That quality that you thought makes you least spiritual, that quality that you thought most disqualifies you from being around God, will actually become the meeting place where God chooses to meet you. This is the season of Advent, and I want to go on a journey with you to find God in this world, in our world, in your world. I will sometimes have the thought, and quite recently I was stressed. There was a massive amount of traffic. I was late for something really important. I was frustrated. Had the thought, John, you got to do the next two hours of life one way or another. You can do it with me. You can trust me. You can be with me. You can count on me. You can relax with me. Or you can do it without me. Stressed, angry, frustrated, alone, incompetent. You're going to do two hours one way or another. It'll, it'll be better if you do it with me. And so I need God. I need to find him in this world. And that's what we're going to look at together through the Advent season because it is about the incarnation of the, it's about the with God life. And there's a beautiful part of the Christmas story uh, that's a bit different than we often think of it. You might know in Luke chapter 2, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, all the world should be taxed. And Joseph went to Bethlehem because it was the city of David. He was of the house and the lineage of David. And while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. And then the, the line from the old King James Version that most of us know is because there was no room for them in the inn. And often in Christmas pageants, there is an innkeeper, kind of a surly guy. Uh, no vacancy here. Sorry, pal. There actually was not an inn. And more recent translations will generally reflect this. Uh, there was a word for a commercial inn, kind of like a Motel 6 in our day, Pandokea. And Jesus uses that, for instance, in his story about the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, where the Good Samaritan finds a guy beat up on the side of the road and takes him to a pendokea, to an inn, gives, it, gives the innkeeper some money. That's not the word that's used in Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, it's the word kataluma. It's the word that Jesus uses later on towards the end of his life when he tells his disciples, go find a place, a room for us to celebrate the Passover. It's the upper room. And a cataluma was generally um, a spare room or a guest room. And what's apparently going on in Luke 2, we think of it as like, Joseph, couldn't you make reservations, pal? You got a pregnant wife, you show up, she's about to give birth and can't find a place. No, 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 no. While they were there, the days were accomplished. So apparently they got there sometime before she went into labor. And it would have been a village where hospitality is a big priority. Wonderful writer named Ken Bailey writes about this. And so there would have been most certainly family relatives of Joseph because he was at the house of David that would have given him a place to stay. In peasant homes back then, there might be a guest room and that would be full enough that it wouldn't be a good place to give birth. Um, there was generally a lower part of the house where because they didn't have much money and they might have a cow or a sheep at night when it was cold, they would actually bring those animals in to that little part of the room. And very often we'd have a little feeding trough for a manger and that's where the baby Jesus is laid. So somebody did make room for him on that day. The manger uh, carries a great weight in this story also. You might remember the shepherds go and sing to the, I mean, the angels go and sing to the shepherds. Um, uh, Fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That word manger is mentioned three separate times in this little passage. It's a sign for the shepherds. Um, uh, the idea of a sign is that uh, it's not just an arbitrary means of identification. You'll know because I'll be wearing a red carnation. A sign expresses, participates in, is... Uh, embodying somehow the reality to which it points. And shepherds in Israel were 
considered a pretty low class occupation. They're actually considered an unclean occupation. Quite often sheep are pretty dirty and smelly and messy. And when you're with them, you're around the manure. And there's often blood. If there's cuts in southern Uganda, there's insects. So shepherds generally were not regarded as clean enough to enter into, for example, a temple or a place of worship. Um, they would not expect to be allowed around any important um, sacred space. But now when Jesus is coming, it's not, it's, it's God saying, I'm going to make room for you. And now shepherds, you wouldn't think that you would get into a palace where this king would be born, but he's not going to be born in a palace. He's born in a little peasant house. He's lying not in a crib that you might buy from Ikea, not in a little robe that you get from Nordstrom, swaddling clothes in a manger. He's like you. He's like one of you. You'll be welcome. There'll be space for you. So then we are invited to make space in our lives in this season for him, to do life together with him, to be looking for him because he's already there. What if that quality that you thought makes you least spiritual, that quality that you thought most disqualifies you from being around God, will actually become the meeting place, will actually become the occasion, that aspect of your life um, where God chooses to meet you? There's a wonderful book called Sacred Fire by Ronald Rollheiser, and he writes in it about uh, a priest who discovered there was a kind of a distance between him and God. And he had this analogy. He said, I'll sometimes think of my life like a mansion and there might be 30 rooms in it and 27 of them I've given over to God. But three of the rooms for him, it was the room of anger, the room of sexuality and the room of money. I'm, I'm keeping those. I don't want to hand those over. And so he formed a little fellowship of the withered hand with some fellow priests where he could be honest and talk about, I don't want to give this part of my life to God and together with them experience the grace of surrender. And uh, Rollheiser has a wonderful poem, at least I think it's wonderful, by Margaret Halaska that captures both our resistance to handing over all the rooms in our house to God and God's infinite patience in dealing with us. Because there's room. The poem is entitled Covenant. Here's how it goes. The father knocks at my door, seeking a home for his son. Rent is cheap, I say. I don't want to rent, I want to buy, says God. I'm not sure I want to sell, but you might come in and look around. I think I will, says God. I might let you have a room or two. I like it, says God, I'll take two. You might decide to give me more someday. I can wait, says God. I'd like to give me more, but it's a bit difficult. I need some space for me. I know, says God, but I'll wait. I like what I see. Hmm. Maybe I can let you have another room. I really don't need that much. Thanks, says God. I'll take it. I like what I see. I'd like to give you the whole house but I'm not sure. Think on it, says God. I wouldn't put you out. Your house would be mine, and my son would live in it. You'd have more space than you'd ever had before. I don't understand at all. I know, says God. But I can't tell you about that. You'll have to discover it for yourself. That can only happen if you let him have the whole house. I'll be risky, I say. Yes, says God, but try me. I'm not sure. I'll let you know. I can wait, says God. I like what I see. And so God comes. There was a wonderful book by a man named Bob Munger. I knew him when I was very young and he was quite old. And he, he had this throwaway sermon one time where the picture was somebody with a house and they would kind of walk through it with Jesus and here's the study, that's kind of my mind, that's kind of messed up and um, here's the dining room, my appetites get kind of off and here's the living room, a place to meet with Jesus and in intimacy but often I just kind of blow it off and 
And then I, the idea that is, what if I made my heart, my life, his home? Just turn the whole thing over to him. There's room, there's room, there's room. So as we go into this Advent season, the question is, where do I resist doing that? What are the rooms? My time, my anger, my sexuality. For me, today, just today, it's two rooms, the room of fear and the room of sadness. Because I'm afraid about what will happen. That comes up for me sometimes, sometimes worse than others. And I'm sad about what has happened. Those are the two rooms. And the invitation is, let Jesus into them and find him there. Be sad together with him. Tell him what I'm afraid of and listen to him say, you don't have to live in fear today because I'll be with you. Now, as we go through this journey together, part of what I love about this series is getting to talk to some friends and particularly some younger friends and some people with lots of wisdom about how life works and how to find God in our actual word, uh, world. There are some themes that have been occurring already. I've been having some of those conversations around, for example, the idea of the table and in particular around the idea of interruption. And of course, Christmas is the ultimate interruption. So we're going to go on that journey together. You're going to get to meet some people that you may not yet know and that I think you will um, find enormously helpful. The conversations have been so rich. Just a little warning ahead of time. Um, normally, these videos go about 10 to 12 minutes, but with these conversations, they're going to go about 20. So you can cut them in half if you want to. You can listen to the whole thing. You can... Um, divvy it up however you want to do it let me know what you think I understand a lot of times we get into kind of a rhythm of a certain time frame so this kind of an experiment uh, just to do over the next couple of weeks but I think that you will love hearing these voices and I promise you I promise you there is room the father is seeking a home for his son you're going to do life one way or the other with God or without it's better with Hey, if you like that video, go ahead and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss any future episodes in this series, Finding God in Your World, where John will sit down with a different guest each episode, asking them that simple question, where are you finding God in your world? If you want more resources, head on over to becomenew.com slash subscribe, where you can let us know if you'd like to receive the emails that go along with each video with extra content and information, or if you want to sign up for the text reminders whenever we drop a new video. Also, if you've got a prayer request, there's a group of us who meet each weekday, Monday through Friday, to pray for viewers just like yourself. So you can send us your prayer request to 855-888-0444, and we would love to pray for you. We'll catch you next time.